Okay, so now we get to the sort of ultimate about this business of strategy and role play and how to think and seeing through his eyes and seeing through everybody else's eyes and fighting your own demons, la la la. <clears throat> the ultimate is why God chooses it to be this way. Okay, here's what he's he's claiming. All right, and I'm going to depict it that way because he wants to demonstrate his claim. That's really part of the the being in him, the oneness. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. Psalm 89, Psalm 37, you know, a thousand other places in the Old Testament. Righteousness and truth go before him. Justice is his throne. You've seen those verses many times. But the question is how, you know, what is righteousness? What is justice? What is love? What is truth? And what are God's own definitions of them rather than our own? Because our own are so limited and puny and really, quite frankly, wrong. Our idea of perfection is wrong. We assume a thing is perfect if everything works. We do not consider perfection to include all imperfection. At the same time, in fact, <clears throat> we're busy sitting here thinking that we're fighting evil for good and we define evil as anything that is not perfect and we define anything perfect as being nice and good. But that's not God's definition. This is why Satan's fighting God, actually, because it's not God's definition. God's definition is that all truth should be full spectrum, all evil should be allowed to exist, have its own nature, all bad should be allowed to exist, have its own nature, God not causing any of those things. But allowing freedom means that it will exist. And that's why Isaiah 45, 7 reads as it does, God created the evil one, namely Satan. Corrected translation. And therefore, evil comes into the world. This is what Augustine couldn't figure out, and his treatise on the will is completely wrecked, because he never understood the point about freedom. Augustine didn't think we had free will. Calvin inherited that idea. That's why Calvinism is so flat wrong in all of its formulations about the nature of God and everything else it thinks. It gets right that it's faith alone in Christ alone, but it doesn't understand that faith is free and it's a product of free will, which God ensures, not imposes. So where are we with this? Where we are is that God's own raison d'être, his own reason for wanting to live, is because he loves righteousness. He loves freedom because it isn't righteous if it's not free. Okay, but that means you're going to end up loving unrighteousness too. And how can you love unrighteousness without becoming evil? That's Satan's big conundrum. Okay, but you can love unrighteousness if you make good on it. How do you make good on unrighteousness and let it be free? If you're going to let it be free, then it's going to continue to be unrighteous. So how is that loving righteousness then? See the conundrum? And what God's saying is, look, I love freedom, therefore truth be free, therefore truth can be evil, therefore it's a matter of free will that truth exists as an evil also. You know, because it'd be true that a thing is evil or good. <laughs> It'd be true that a person can create a thing or do a thing that is evil or good freely with its own free effects. Okay, but God being over all can use his omnipotence to make good on all, whether good or bad, without restricting, shaving, curtailing freedom. Now Satan wonders, and so do we, how can this be? you got the rape of Nanking, you've got the Holocaust where all the Jews were tormented beyond belief. You've got a thousand other things that go wrong on every single day that it's like, the, how can there be any justice? 
I mean, when you kill a murderer, you can execute him when the state executes him. That doesn't solve anything. It just stops the murderer from murdering again. That's all it ever does. It isn't a true payment for the crime committed. The only way you could really pay for the crime committed would be to restore the person who was murdered to life. And no one can do that. But God is saying, hi, I'm, I know how to make good on everything bad that happens, freely happens. And of course, everything that happens has its own lifespan and ends at a certain point or shifts or changes nature in a certain way. For example, the people never believe in Christ. They have some moment when they die. The angels at some moment are thrown into the lake of fire and that's a new universe. But you know what? People and the demons continue to sin there. Their souls go on forever. How does God make good on all that? And yeah, okay, the reason why hell goes on forever is because that way they still have a chance to believe in Christ and get out of hell. But what about all the sin that they're sinning? That's an offense against God. Whether we, the humans and the angels who are elect, see that, I don't know. But God sees it. He's always seen it. He's seen it since eternity past. How is it making good on to allow it to go on? It's a valid question. And I don't have the answer. I only know this is his answer. So it boils down to, okay, God considers it righteous to let hell go on forever. God considers it righteous to let murder and rape and all these other things that we, you know, ponder. How can this be? How can this be fair? How can God allow? This is why there are so many atheists. If there's evil in the world, then if there's a God who allows it, then he's not just. This is their argument, so there must be no God. You can empathize with them. That's a good argument that they make. So it really kind of boils down to, hi, God claims to make good on every speck of bad that there is. And he uses his omnipotence to do it, and this is why he allows it to exist. And that's why he's willing to watch it. Because, you know, the one who's most offended and the, mo the one who's most, how do you want to call it, not exactly harmed, but since he is righteous and this is in his face all the time, the one who's got the right to rule on it the most, to make justice out of it is him because the offense is really against him. And he lets it go on, claiming that by letting it go on, there's a greater justice that he executes that makes it worthwhile for the offense to exist in his eyes in the first place. Even the continuing hell that continues to exist, that's an offense to him also. And yeah, we can see some things that he makes good on. I mean, look, we're evil. <clears throat> he saves us anyway, and we go on sinning anyway, if, even after salvation. He doesn't turn us into stepford wives doing good deeds. And the good deeds really aren't good deeds. They don't do anything for him. Might do something for the human race, but it's small, it's petty, and we get all, you know, ego, you know, ego puffing about it. That's not good. That's evil, too. So even good deeds are evil. That's Satan's plan, actually. So how does God make good on it so that it's worth his own time to watch it to exist, to watch its existence? What does he do to it? What does he make out of it that keeps its own nature what it is without, you know, shaving freedom? And yet using it as a juridical occasion to manufacture what he calls good that is beyond our imagination. Beyond what you can think or imagine. I want to say that's Ephesians 3.20 that just flew into my mind. It might be 1.20. Beyond what you can ask or imagine is the English translation. Well, I don't know. But this is his claim. 
I don't know what he can do. I don't know how it can be better. I don't know the kind of love for righteousness that he has that he allows the bad to exist because high at every point in time from the time that it's first committed until the time that it dies of its own lifespan, I'm making good on it because I have to see it and I'm God. Okay, I don't know how he does that and I don't know what it is that he does, but I know him. So I guess that makes me arbitrary too because... You have to call what he's doing to it arbitrary because the thing itself doesn't have anything that you can make into that of itself is good. So it's something he just flat juridically declares even as he flat juridically declared me saved after stabbing my sins into Christ, which after all didn't save me. My sins are my sins. They still exist for as long as they exist. They got stabbed into Christ before I was born. And they were just stabbed in him. The sins didn't change. And because Christ said yes, I'm accepted in him. Christ says yes, I say yes to be okay, you'll save me if I say yes that he paid. Even though technically all that happened was that my sins were stabbed into him. A payment didn't actually take place. God just pronounced it paid. Because he said so. Okay, well, he's just saying so. I'm just pronouncing this evil that exists. I'm just pronouncing that I'm making good on it. And then he does something to it. Just like he saves me. He just pronounces that I'm saved. And I really am saved. It's not fake. But it's the same mechanism. This bad thing happens. I'm, my sins are stabbed into Christ. And so God just pronounces me saved from that. Because Christ said yes. And all I'm supposed to do, therefore, is say yes. And he just flat pronounces me saved. My yes didn't save me. My sin's been stabbed in the Christ didn't save me. It's God saying yes to it that saved me. Well, he's saying yes to all this evil, too. So do I trust him? Well, but he's living with it. Whatever offense there is to me or you, the offense to him is greater and it's lasted longer and it's harsher. Because he knows it's true nature and he never stops experiencing it. Whereas I forget and you forget. Somebody did something bad to me years ago. I mean, I've had a lot of that happen. So what? I forgot about it now. It doesn't mean anything now. It came, it went, it's done. I know a lot of people like to, you know, nurture the suffering that they suffered at someone else's hands that makes them feel like, I don't know, important. They nurture revenge. They nurture wanting to get back at the other person. They get real happy if the person who did wrong to them gets wrong done to them. But honey, I'm here to tell you, there's no joy in that. Every single person who's ever hurt me has been hurt in return, and I didn't do it, and I'm not happy about it. Revenge does not taste sweet. He wanted somebody else doing the revenge to him. All you can do is feel sorry for him and want to comfort them somehow. So I'm sure that God is not gloating When everything that's ever been done wrong gets its comeuppance, and it does get its comeuppance, that's part of it. But that's not the whole of it. He makes good on it, and I'm not sure how. But I'm sure it is true. Because I'm sure of him. So when you go through your life, your ultimate like motive is, is and I've been saying this a lot, as Isaiah 54, 1, Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, God makes good on it. He's God, I'm not. That's all I know. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. If it pleases him, that's all I care about. And I don't understand. Even while I can repeat this to you, and I'm sure that it's true, I'm absolutely 100% sure it's true, I don't understand it like he does. But I know he does. And that's enough for me. 
So that's what gets me up in the morning. I've lost all other motives for wanting to live. And maybe that's where it's supposed to go. Maybe that's the fulfillment of the first commandment. Your God, I'm not. That's all I know. You like it. It pleases you. That's all I care about. I don't have any other reason to want to move, to want to get up, to want to eat, to want to pee, to want to do anything. I don't care if the world gives me everything on a platter. I don't care if everything's nice and decent. I don't care if everything is bad. The bad isn't bad enough. And the good isn't good enough. But you live and that is enough. And that's all I know. So, that has to be it. That has to be the upshot of the trial. I mean, when you look in the Old Testament and in the New, that's what you keep finding. Abraham going to slay his son, even though he knows God didn't really want that, but God gave him the order anyway. And it's like, okay, well, that's what he wants. That's all I know. Surely that's what was in Abraham's head when he raised the knife to Isaac. And Isaac let him do it. Isaac was in his 20s. Hebrew word is not R, it means a marriageable age. So it's somewhere between 20 and 40. In Abraham's family, they married at age 40. Isaac was not yet married. So it wasn't like Abraham fought his kid. The kid elected to be bound for the sacrifice, laying on that slab, whatever it was. And so a, a Isaac is thinking too, well, if it's just what God wants, that's all I know. When David was crowned king, okay, you know, he knew right away that it was going to be some kind of waiting period. And he waited. And then, you know, God put him through the paces. He had to run away. Saul was looking to kill him. And on his own wedding night, his wife let him down in a basket so that he could be spared. Maybe it wasn't his wedding night, but they were not married for very long. And then ten years later, when he comes back, she despises him because he's dancing, as it were, naked. It's not really naked. It's just, you know, little clothing. Because he's bringing the aphod back. Bringing the tent There were so many other times when his, you know, people that were his close confidants turned on him. He had a really terrible time. His confidants turned on him, members of his own family turned on him. But he still believed. And of course, before David, there was Moses, and it was the same story out in the wilderness for 40 years and then God tells him to come back and Abraham, or not Abraham, Moses was kind of nervous because he didn't he was afraid to you know confront Pharaoh so he so Moses who was one of the most eloquent men who ever lived said well I can't talk well so God says okay fine I'll assign Aaron to talk for you and God prohibited him from entering the land at the end because of the second Meribah where he struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to it. But all Moses could think of is your God, I'm not. And so he accepted it. He didn't rebel. And how many of those prophets too? Same story. Isaiah led a tortured life as a prophet. Ezekiel was even worse in some ways having to lie on one side and then lie on the other side to depict the future siege of Jerusalem to the to people out, you know, in the diaspora in Babylon. Knowing that they wouldn't listen. Only able to speak at certain times, otherwise he was mute. Very young guy, like 30 years old when he was called. And so many other prophets, Hebrews 11 talks about the prophets and other people, they were made to wander, they were, they were, you know, tortured in various ways, but they waited on God anyhow. And that's the same rule for us. 
Okay, what does that mean? It means that you lose everything, even while you have it, in order to have the same motive God does for living. He's God, I'm not, that's all I know. He's lives. He says, he says, he says. He loves righteousness and wants to make good on all evil and therefore allows it to exist. Because this is the way to make good on it at every dot of its life. And you don't see that promise fulfilled. But he says so. So you want to go for it too. That's what Christ did on the cross. It says in Hebrews 53.11, He sees, is satisfied. That's the literal translation in Hebrew. He makes, he makes righteous out of his knowledge. Okay, well how do you make righteous out of your knowledge? That's got to be an imputation. That's got to be a juridical ruling. Because the thing he's making righteous is us and we're not righteous. So it's got to be a juridical pronouncement. And of course theology does know that. At least it used to. It used to make the distinction in the 1950s theo theological circles. They used to call it positional sanctification versus experiential sanctification. And that was based on Hebrews 10, which is talking about the very thing. Hebrews 10, 14 and following in particular. You are pronounced righteous in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Even though you are not actually righteous. You still sin, you still live your evil life, la la la, we all do. And once we're dead, we're not like that anymore because God just flat changes us. Because he says so. So if he flat changes us and he says so and this satisfies him, well then who are we to say how he makes good on unrighteousness? It satisfies him, Yireh Yizba, Isaiah 53.11. So it boils down to this. This is what God says. This is what God wants. This is what pleases God. I do you accept that. And you go in his direction because this is what he says, what he wants, what pleases him. The answer is yes, and you're fulfilling the first commandment. And of course only the Holy Spirit can make you do that. And it only happens at moments. Okay, but then that's what your life means. And granted, 99% of the day, your life is busy with the dry cleaning and Johnny getting his hair cut. And do you have to put oil in the car? And all kinds of mundane things. But you can be thinking, Bible, why you do them? Therefore, making good on the mundane. And you know how that works. You see how that works. You see how that ennobles the moment. And then it's not just about Johnny's haircut and doing an email and putting, you know, putting air in the tires. It got used for something else that moment in your soul. And yeah, your body was putting the air in the tires or getting, you know, standing with the barber getting Johnny's hair cut. That's what your body was doing. But that's not what your soul was doing. So then the moment means more than what actually happened with the body. So why can't God do something with it to mean more than the evil that exists too? So it's not like we never learn the mechanism he uses. It's not like we can't see that it's at least plausible that he does it. And we ourselves do get more out of the moment if we're using every moment, no matter how mundane or boring, to learn Bible better or practice it even if we fail. It makes the time worthwhile even if we fail. Which we always do. But there's always a little success too. Because you tried. Well that's meaningful. That makes good on the moment, doesn't it? So okay, it's Sisyphean in the, in the look of it. You do the same thing over and over and over. But you keep on trying and you keep on learning Bible a little bit at a time. 
because you know he's hearing you and so you'd rather think about the learning of the Bible than just spend the moment on oh, I am wearing this dress and somebody else's dress is prettier than mine so what that's a waste of time so you're fighting the good fight in your head and it doesn't matter if you failed to fight it as well as you thought you should have you fought it at all and then you use one John one nine and you got back up again. That pleased him. You know it then. Because you couldn't have done it if the Holy Spirit didn't enable it. What the Holy Spirit does in you, even if it's only for a moment, honey, that's divine level. So then every moment counts. And it lives forever. So you're fighting for righteousness too and you're living for righteousness too. And okay, maybe you can call it arbitrary, but it's what you choose. You're choosing him. You're choosing his motives, his reasoning, his ideas. And that is fulfilling, there's no doubt about that. Even when you fail, at least you tried and there was a moment. So, now you're living the way God does. That's worth living for. Even if you do it over and over again like he does. Like he chooses to do because he could just snap his fingers and everything would be perfect and nice. By our definition. Okay, but that's not the definition he wants. Or it would be like that now. It's very tiring to live like that. I don't know why he likes it. But I know that he likes it. And if that's what he wants, then I gotta learn to want that too. One moment at a time.